Um, how many of you have not read any books by me? And you won't get in trouble. I just want to get a sense of who my audience is. So you've never read any Jacqueline Woodson books. So just raise your hand, I just wanna, okay, cool. So I, you know sometimes people get up and then they start talking about all their work and you're like, who is this person and why are they talking to me? So um, I, I wanted to get a sense of who knew me. So I've written 31 books and I've written everything from picture books to middle grade books to books for young adults to books for adults. Um, and I've known I wanted to be a writer since I was seven. Um, the picture books include the Other Side, Each Kindness, um, Visiting Day, um, the young adult books are After Tupac and Dee Foster, Miracles Boys. Hopefully, do you, does, do you, uh, do the schools have libraries? Okay, so hopefully they're in your library, so hopefully after this you'll be excited about having met me and go find some books. So hopefully your teachers might assign a book or two or take you to my website or something, get you prepared for the next time you meet me. So this is from my book, Locomotion. This whole book's a poem, because every time I try to tell the whole story, my mind goes, be quiet. Only it's not my mind's voice, it's Miss Edna's over and over, be quiet. I'm not a loud kid, I swear, I'm just me, and sometimes maybe I make a little bit of noise. If I was a grown-up, maybe Miss Edna would be telling me to be quiet all the time, but I'm 11, and maybe 11's just noisy, maybe 12's quieter. But when Miss Edna's voice comes on, the ideas in my head go out like a candle, and all you see left is this little string of smoke that disappears real quick before I have a chance to find out what it's trying to say. So this whole book's a poem because poetry's short and this whole book's a poem because Miss Marcus says write it down before it leaves your brain I tell her about the string of smoke thing and she says good Lonnie write that not a whole lot of people be saying good Lonnie to me so I write the string of smoke thing down real fast and Miss Marcus says we'll worry about those line breaks later right fast Lonnie Miss Marcus says I'm thinking yeah but write fast before Miss Edna's voice comes on and turns my candle light blows my candle idea out so Locomotion is a book about a sixth grade boy who's in foster care, and he's in foster care because he, they've lo he's lost his mom and dad, and he's in um, a foster home, Miss Edna's foster home, which is separate from his sister Lily's foster home. So they've, been, they've not only lost their parents, but they've also been separated. Um, and it's a series of poems that tell the story and, um, and it's fiction. Because what I write, for the most part, is realistic fiction. So it's stuff that could have happened to someone, might have happened to someone, but didn't necessarily happen to me. Um, this is from Miracles Boys, which is uh, another story about three brothers who are half black and half Puerto Rican who um, also their parents died. I kill off a lot of parents in my books. And, um, and Miracles Boys was made into a mini-series, but the book is much better than the mini-series. Um, Brothers is the baddest, then comes Dominicans. Dominicans don't mess around. I'm cool with Dominicans, though. They don't mess with me. I don't mess with them. I lay back on my bed and listen to my brother, New Charlie, talking. For as long as I could remember, he'd been going on about who was the baddest. Used to be Puerto Ricans were the baddest, but somewhere along the road, their status dropped. Brothers were always at the top of the next ones down. New Charlie wasn't talking to me. Since he'd gotten back from Rawway Home for Boys a few months ago, he never talked to me. He was combing his hair back and talking to his boy, Aaron. They'd known each other forever to say what's up and stuff, but New Charlie and Aaron didn't start hanging tight till New Charlie got back from Rawway. Seems once New Charlie saw the inside of Rawway, all the brothers around here who cut school and hung out real late thought New Charlie was some kind of wonderful actor like New Charlie was their brother, actor like New Charlie was me. So in Miracles Boys, Obviously, New Charlie has just gotten back from juvenile detention, a juvenile detention center. And when I was writing that book, since I had never been to a juvenile detention center, I actually went to this place in Massachusetts called Connolly Home for Boys, and I spent five days there. And um, all during the day, I would hang out with the guys who were between 10 and 18 years old, who had um, were there for all kinds of reasons. And then at night, I go back to my hotel room and write. Um, and then so in Miracles Boys, all the stuff that I describe physically about New Charlie really happened. This is from the other side. That summer, the fence that stretched through our town seemed bigger. We lived in a yellow house on one side of it, and white people lived on the other. Mama said, don't climb over that fence when you play. She said it wasn't safe. That summer, there was a girl who wore a pink sweater. Each morning, she climbed up on that fence and stared over at our side. She never sat up on that fence with anyone that girl didn't. Once when we were jumping rope, that girl asked if she could play, and my friend Sandra said no without even asking the rest of us. I don't know what I would have said. Maybe yes, maybe no. That's 
summer, everything and everyone on the other side of that fence seemed far away. When I asked my mama how come, she said, because that's the way things have always been. Sometimes when I went into town with my mama, I saw that girl with her mama. She looked sad sometimes, that girl did. Don't stare, my mama said. It's not polite. It rained a lot that summer. On rainy days, that girl sat up on that fence in a raincoat. She let herself get all wet and acted like she didn't even care. Mama wouldn't let me go out in the rain. That's why I bought you rainy day toys, my mama said. You stay inside here where it's warm and safe and dry. But every time it rained, I always looked for that girl, and I always found her somewhere near that fence. Some place in the middle of the summer, the rain stopped. When I walked outside that morning, the grass was damp and the sun was already high up in the sky. I put my arms in the air. I felt brave that day. I felt free. I got close to that fence and that girl asked me my name. Clover, I said. Well, my name's Annie, she said. Annie Paul. I live over yonder, she said. By where you see the laundry, that's my blouse hanging on the line. She smiled then. She had a pretty smile. And then I smiled and we stood there staring at each other, smiling. It's nice up on this fence, Annie said. You can see all over. I ran my hand along the fence. I reached up and touched the top of it. A fence like this was made for sitting on, Annie said. She looked at me sideways. My mother says I shouldn't go to the other side, I said. Well, my mama says the same thing, but she never said none about sitting on it. <gasps> Neither did mine. That summer, me and Annie sat together on that fence, and when Sandra and them looked at us funny, I just made believe I didn't even care. Some mornings, my mama watched us. I waited for her to tell me to get down before I break my neck or something, but she never did. I see you made a new friend, my mama said one morning, and I nodded, and mama smiled. And that summer, me and Annie sat together on that fence and watched the whole wide world around us. One morning, Sandra and them were jumping rope near the fence, and we asked if we could play, and Sandra said, I don't care. And when we jumped, me and Sandra were partners the way we used to be. And when we were too tired to jump anymore, we sat up on that fence, all of us, in a long, long line. Someday, somebody's going to come along and knock this old fence down. And he said, and I nodded, yeah, someday. So the other side is a picture book. Um, and with the picture book, you should be able to re hear the words and imagine the pictures in your head. Or you should be able, if you're... Um, not a great reader or not reading, um, to be able to look at the pictures and know the story. I was a really, 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 really slow reader as a kid. And I had to read things over and over and over and over again until I finally understood them. And, and from a really young age, I was saying that I wanted to be a writer. And I, all, um, and I would get in trouble a lot for lying. And so I had a teacher who said, instead of lying, write it down. Because if you write it down, it's not a lie anymore. It's fiction. And so, um, so I was writing all the time. I was reading slowly, reading slowly. And I think for a lot of people, it didn't make sense. How could someone who reads so slowly, who struggles so with reading, actually think they can be a writer? I realized much, much later that what I was doing was I was reading like a writer. I was reading slowly. I was really trying to understand how the author got the story on the page, how the author got me to think a certain way when I cried, how did the author get me to cry, um, all of that stuff. I knew Jason was going to show up. I knew he was going to sneak in here. So that's my boy Jason Reynolds, who's an amazing, amazing writer who wrote, who you all should also read, Boy in a Black Suit, When I Was the Greatest, and, um, and he was here. Yesterday, were you here? Last week. See, y'all lucked out. Y'all got me instead of him. <laughs> So anyway, um, so, so I just read the same things all the time. Um, and it was how I learned to write. So um, now you have a little background of some of my books. So when you go to, back to your library or when your teacher says, you know what, let's do an author study on Jacqueline Woodson. Um, next time you meet me, you'll say, oh, I read After Tupac and D. Foster. Oh, I read Miracles Boys. Oh, I read, I don't know. I, I forgot what books I wrote even. So Brown Girl Dreaming is a memoir. Um, so finally, I'm actually writing about my life. And um, this is the book you're getting in the back. They're really cute pictures of me and my family. And so you meet all the people through the words. And then in the back, you meet them in the pictures. I grew up, I was born in Ohio, and then I moved to Greenville, South Carolina, and then I moved to Brooklyn to a neighborhood called Bushwick. Um, 
And so I'm going, and we grew up Jehovah's Witnesses. And then later on, um, we also converted um, and became Muslim. So, so I'm just giving you a little background before I start reading. Two gods, two worlds. It's barely morning and we're already awake. My grandmother in the kitchen ironing our Sunday clothes. Oh, I'm sorry. So when I was two months old, my mom and dad separated. And my mom took us from Ohio to Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and in Greenville, South Carolina, we were mostly raised by my grandmother and my grandfather. And we call my grandfather Daddy, um, because that's what my mom called him. And, um, and then, it, then eventually, as part of the Great Migration, we came to Brooklyn, New York. I can hear Daddy coughing in his bed, a cough like he'll never catch his breath. The sound catches in my chest as I'm pulling my dress over my head. Hold my own breath until the coughing stops still. I hear him pad through the living room, hear the squeak of the front screen door, and know he's made his way to the porch swing to smoke a cigarette. My grandfather doesn't believe in God. My grandfather doesn't believe in a God that won't let him smoke or have a cold beer on a Friday night. A God that tells us all the world is ending so that y'all y'all will walk through the world afraid as cats. Your God is not my God, he says. His cough moves through the air, back into our room where the light is almost blue, the white winter sun painting it. I wish the coughing would stop. I wish he would put on Sunday clothes, take my hand, walk with us down the road. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that everyone who doesn't follow God's word will be destroyed in a great battle called Armageddon. And when the battle is done, there will be a fresh new world, a nicer, more peaceful world. But I want the world where my daddy is and don't know why anybody's God would make me have to choose. Family. In the books, there's always the happily ever after. The ugly duckling grows into a swan. Pinocchio becomes a boy. The witch gets chucked into the oven by Gretel. The selfish giant goes to heaven. Even Winnie the Pooh seems to always get his honey. Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother is freed from the belly of the wolf. When my sister reads to me, I wait for the moment when the story moves faster toward the happy ending that I know is coming. On the bus home from Greenville, I wake to the almost happy ending. My mother standing at the station, Roman in his stroller, his smile bright, his arms reaching for us. But we see the white hospital band like a bracelet on his wrist. Tomorrow he will return there. We are not all finally and safely home. So when I was growing up, my brother was in the hospital, Roman was in the hospital a lot. He had lead poisoning. And so um, that, that poem is when we come back from South Carolina and he has to go back to Kings County Hospital. Pasteles y panil. When Maria's brother Carlos gets baptized, he is just a tiny baby in a white lace gown with so many $20 bills folded into, his, into fans pinned all over it that he looks like a green and white angel. Maria and I stand over his crib talking about all the candy we could buy with just one of those fans. But we know that God is watching and don't even dare touch the money. In the kitchen there is Benil roasting in the oven, the delicious smell filling the house, and Maria says, you should eat just a little bit. But I am not allowed to eat pork. Instead, I wait for pasteles to get passed around, wait for the ones her mother has filled with chicken, for Jackie, mi ajiada. Wait for the moment when I can peel the paper away from the crushed plantain covered meat, break off small pieces with my hands, and let the pasteles melt in my mouth. My mother makes the best pasteles in Brooklyn, Maria says, and even though I've only eaten her mom's, I agree. Whenever there is the smell of benil and pasteles on the block, we know there is a celebration going on. And tonight the party is at Maria's house. The music is loud and the cake is big and the pasteles that her mother has been making for three days are absolutely perfect. We take our food out to her stoop just as the grown-ups start dancing merengue, the women lifting their long dresses to show off their fast-moving feet, the men clapping and yelling, baila, baila, until the living room floor disappears. When I ask Maria where Diana is, she says, they're coming late. This part is just for my family. 
She pulls the crisp skin away from the banil, eats the pork shoulder with rice and beans, our plates balanced on our laps, tall glasses of malta beside us, and for a long time, neither of us says anything. Yeah, I say, this is only for us, the family. Danny Mora, when I was growing up, my uncle was in prison. At the gate of the prison, guards glare at us, then slowly allow us in. My big brother is afraid. He looks up at the barbed wire, puts his hands in his pockets. I know he wishes he was home with his chemistry set. I know he wants to be anywhere but here. Nothing but stone and a big building that goes so far up and so far back and forth that we can't see where the beginning is or where it might end. Gray brick, small windows covered with wire. Who could see out from there? The guards check our pockets, check our bags, make us walk through x-ray machines. My big brother holds out his arms, let the guards pat him down from shoulder to ankle, checking for anything he might be hiding. His name is Hope Austin Woodson II, part of a long line of Woodsons, doctors and lawyers and teachers, but as quickly as that, he can become a number. Like Robert Leon Irby is now so many numbers across his pocket, of course, across the pocket of his prison uniform, that it's hard not to keep looking at them, waiting for them to morph into letters that spell out my uncle's name. And this last one, um, I'm gonna read two more. This is Bushwick History Lesson and then maybe Mecca. Before German mothers wrapped scarves around their heads, kissed their own mothers goodbye, and headed across the world to Bushwick. Before the Italian fathers sailed across the ocean for the dream of America and found themselves in Bushwick. Before Dominican daughters donned guinzanera dresses and walked proudly down Bushwick Avenue. Before young brown boys in cut-off shorts spun their first tops and played their first games of skelly on Bushwick streets, before any of that, this place was called Bostwick. Settled by the Dutch and Franciscus the Negro, a former slave who bought his freedom. And all of New York was called New Amsterdam, run by a man named Peter Stuyvesant. There were slaves here. Those who could afford to own their freedom lived on the other side of the wall, and now that place is called Wall Street. When my teacher says, so write down what all of this means to you, our heads bend over our notebook, the whole class silent, the whole class belonging somewhere, Bushwick. I didn't just appear one day. I didn't just wake up and know how to write my name. I keep writing, knowing now that I was a long time coming. Maybe Mecca. There is a teenager on our block with one arm missing. We call him Lefty and he tells us he lost his arm in Vietnam. That's a war, he says. Y'all too lucky, y'all lucky to be too young to go. It doesn't hurt anymore, he tells us when we gather around him. But his eyes are sad eyes and some days he walks around the block maybe a hundred times without saying anything to anyone. When we call, hey Lefty, he doesn't even look our way. Some evenings I kneel toward Mecca with my uncle. Maybe Mecca is the place Lefty goes to in his mind when the memory of losing his arm becomes too much. Maybe Mecca is good memories, presents and stories and poetry and arroz con pollo and family and friends. Maybe Mecca is the place everyone is looking for. It's out there in front of you, my uncle says. I'll know it when I get there. Thank you. So who has questions for me? In the back, and if you could just stand up and tell me your name. Um, so good question, Joey. Thanks for starting us off. What's the publishing process like? I think the hardest part about getting published is finishing a book. Um, and so once I've finished the book, um, I have a couple of people I trust read it. The first time they read it, I have my partner and two of my friends read it. And the first time they read it, I say, you can only tell me what you love about it. I don't want to hear any criticism, nothing, just everything you love about it. And it's not until I've rewritten it. A Brown Girl Dreaming, I rewrote 31 times. It took three and a half years before 
you, it's the book you see here. Um, and then I have an editor who I've been working with for 13 years. And then after I've revised it probably about five more times on my own, I give it to my editor and say I've just finished another book and then she reads and it says this is a great beginning. And then I start revising again and um, once um, once it gets to a place where it's publishable, they, you know, I get paid. They, they buy the books for me. So they buy the books, they pay me for the book, um, and, then they, and then Penguin is my publisher. They're the ones who publish it. But the hardest part really is finishing it. <laughs> Thanks. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, what was so interesting about what you about writing the books? What was so interesting about writing books? Um, I just love telling stories. Like I think it's the thing that from a really young age I was constantly making up stories. And I think um, the way some people you know, love playing ball or love singing or love uh, drawing, like for me writing was the thing I love doing. And even when I, uh, when I first realized that writing is just, when I learned how to write my name, it's like you put letters together, they make words. You put words together, they make sentences. Sentences make like paragraphs. That was magic to me, that that's all it was. And so being able to take all the stories that were in my head, all the lies and put them down on page, on paper felt like I was, um, you know, felt like magic. And also being able to create worlds, right? So you have an experience, it's not the best experience in the world. You go back and you rewrite that experience and make it something completely different. And that, that was really powerful for me. Yes? Uh huh. What gave you the love of children? Mm hmm. Uh, so you mean? Um, so Caitlin's question was, what gave me the love of reading to children or writing for young people? Oh, so um, you know, I didn't. I didn't know I was going to be a writer of books for young people. I knew that I was just going to tell stories, but it was um, my protagonist always ended up being between the age of like say seven and sixteen, and then someone said, "Oh, that's young adult fiction, or that's children's fiction." Um, and and I, I feel like so much of what my own memory comes from when I was a really young, when I was a young kid. So I like to go back and write from that place. Um, because one of the rules of writing is write what you know, and I know that time and place. So I can go back and say, okay, I remember what it was like to be 14, and this was happening, and that was happening, and so then I can create a character who has those same experiences. It has, it's hard to believe I had trouble reading, really, because I memorize so much. <laughs> I think that's, what, that's why I memorize so much, because then I don't have to read it. Uh-huh, yes. Say say the last part again, I say. Um the what the locomotion book, the foster home? Um, so, so, um, so I, w I wasn't in foster care, but I was. I definitely I worked with runaway and homeless kids for a long time, and so, so, and then when I was a, um, when I was starting to write, I realized that there were so many stories that weren't told. There's so many kids in foster homes. There's so many people that are incarcerated. When you look at the number of mass incarceration, everyone has a family member or knows somebody who's been in jail, and and there weren't books about that. And so, and I know when I was a kid and my uncle was in jail, we were never supposed to tell anybody, right? It was supposed to be, oh, your uncle moved upstate. It's like, why are all these brothers moving upstate suddenly? Like, you know, we knew that people were getting incarcerated. And so, so that was definitely inspiration. You know, I definitely wanted to write about stuff that I didn't see in books and that, that felt real true to my life. And some of it, you know, but it wasn't necessarily stuff that happened to me. Like the foster care didn't happen to me, but I know a lot of people who have gone through the foster care system or uh, but you know the incarceration thing I wasn't incarcerated but my uncle was you know so I there were there were ways in which life um, inspired the art 
No, my uncle was never in foster care. I didn't, uh, no, no, the, the, foster, the lo locomotion, that story is fiction. So that one's fiction, but the one, my uncle was in jail. So, so my uncle, that, so that one, that was from Brown Girl Dreaming, and this is actually nonfiction. This is a memoir, but the first, it's confusing because I, um, I recited so many different books. But Locomotion, the boy who's learning to tell the story of his life through poetry, that's fiction. And, and, but, and that was inspired by wanting to write about people in foster care. Uh, let's go back over here. Yes. What's your name? Uh huh. Um, what inspired me to start writing books? I just, um, well, when the teacher said, write it down so that it's not a lie. And when I learned how to write, I realized I could write stuff down. So that really inspired me to start writing. And I always said I want to have my name on a book one day. So, in the back. What's your name? And what was the last part of that? Yeah, you know what made me, um, so, um, and the question was, did I make up stories and that make me want to write stories, right? Um, I, I did, I was making up stories all the time and just saying them, like, and I talk about it in Brown Girl Dreaming, like if someone said I did blah, 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 I'm like, oh yeah, well I did that too and I did this and that, and you know, kind of always had a story. And um, then when the teacher said, you know, write this down, stop lying, <laughs> you know, it was like, wait a second, I could put that on a page, I could write that down, and it is a story that not only do I not get in trouble for, but people pay money for and they give you stickers for your books. I mean, this isn't lies, but um, you know, the other books. Um, so yeah, definitely inspired me. Uh, Did you ever get caught lying? I get caught lying all the time, which means I probably wasn't a good liar, right? So, <laughs> yes? Uh, while you were writing your book, were you ever inspired by other authors? Yeah, um, what's your name? Raylan. Raylan? So Raylan's question was, when I was writing, was I ever inspired by other authors? I'm inspired by other authors all the time. And I, um, you know, when I get stuck writing, I'll go read. Like when I was stuck writing Round Girl, I was reading a lot of poetry. Um, I have a shelf of go-to books that I read again and again for inspiration. I mean, you learn to write by reading. Um, and it's not about how fast or slow you read. It's just about reading and learning from the authors. I'll take one more on here, and then I'll come to that side. Yes? Who's my favorite author? I have so many, you know, from the early, you know, I have a lot of poets. I love Cornelia C.D. I love Maya Angela. Well, I love early Maya Angela. I love um, uh, Nick Flynn, Michael Klein. I love, uh, I love Jason Reynolds. I think he's a bad, uh, not, I, I was gonna say something, but I can't curse. So I think he's a really good writer. <laughs> so um, 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 Christopher Paul Curtis, Mildred Taylor. Um, um, Rita Williams Garcia, Walter D. Meyer. I mean, I have a list. I could just go on and on. And I read books. I read books by the people I love again and again too. So yes, yes. My name is Nelly. I have a um, so what was my first book and when was it published? The first book I ever wrote was a book called Martin Luther King and His Birthday that was written by me and um, illustrated by Floyd Cooper. And it was really badly written by me and really badly illustrated by Floyd Cooper. And thankfully it's out of print and you can't find it. Um, and then even, hopefully not even in this rare books room. Um, and then the next book was a book called Last Summer with Mason. Uh, and that was published in 1990. So, yes. That's such a great question. Tell me your name again. Allison. 
Allison wants to know, when I'm writing, putting my characters on the page, how do I get their emotion on the page? Do I make it up in my head or do I use other people's emotions? I always say that my books are not physically autobiographical, except Brown Girl, um, but they're always emotionally autobiographical. So if I'm writing something and it's a really sad scene and I'm not crying, then it's not working. And so, so if my cat, I have a, um, I didn't recite it to you, but there's a book where um, the main character dies, and then in the next book he's um, he's kind of trying to figure it. He doesn't know he's dead yet, um, and I'm um, trying to get how his his girlfriend really misses him, and I'm writing her story, and I'm feeling really really sad, and I know it's working. Or when I write something and I'm cracking myself up writing it, then I know it's really funny. Even though my kids are like, that's not funny. Like you know, I'll try to tell them like, does my daughter's 13 and my son's seven. I'm like, does this sound good? And they're like, no, it's not. You're just not funny, mommy. Um, but um, but yeah. So it's my own emotion. So the books are very emotional. So when I'm writing, I do feel the emotion I'm trying to put in my character. Yes. What's your name? Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, so Treasure's question was what, um, I, I name my favorite authors, but why do I like those authors? Uh, which is a good question. I, I like authors that make me think. I like authors whose work feels really original. Um, I like authors whose writing style um, makes like pushes the boundaries and makes me think about my own writing style. I like stories where there's a, a an academic, a woman named Rudine Sims Bishop, and she was a professor at Ohio State University. And one thing she talked about was how readers need both mirrors and windows. So you want to be able to open up a book and say, Oh yeah, I'm a brown girl. Oh, I love poetry. Oh, I used to live down south and see parts of yourself in the book. That's called a mirror. But you also want to look in a book and say, wow, I never had that experience. That's crazy. I didn't know it could happen like that. And that's a window into another world. And so I like writers who give me new experiences, but also writers that show me parts of myself in the book. Yes? What's your name? How did I know by the age of seven that I wanted to be a writer? Because that was when I started writing. That's when I started, I learned to write my name. And I was like, wait a second, these words have meaning. And, it, and that's how I knew, yes, I'm going to do this. Yes. What's your name? Have I thought of what? Have I thought of singing the story out? It's a good question. You have obviously never heard me sing. <laughs> I cannot sing at all. You know, my seven-year-old is like, please, mommy, don't sing. Um, um, but it's a good, can you sing? Oh, yeah, no, I cannot sing. But it's, it's a good question because um, sound means a lot to me. So I read everything I write out loud, and it has the sound a certain way. So even though I can't sing, there's a certain rhythm to my writing that I have to hear. So it has to look a certain way on the page, but I also have to hear it. And I know when I'm rewriting and rereading, when I'm stumbling over stuff, that the rhythm is off, and I, then I start editing it. But man, no, I can't sing. So that's it. That's it for the questions. Now we can get busy signing. Yay. Yay. Thank you.